We do it every time we drive a car and we never give it a moment's thought. With a few dabs on the brake, we bring a huge hunk of steel, glass and rubber to a shuddering halt. But what does an 18th century industrialist's quest for a source of cheap and clean power have to do with my car brakes? Ah, a pub. What a stroke of luck. Excuse me. Can I have a non-alcoholic fruit-based beverage, please? As I'm driving. The story starts with a prolific inventor name of Joseph Brahma, born in 1748. He developed all kinds of things, unpickable locks to machine tools, but his most successful area of experimentation was with liquids. <sighs> he knew that liquids would not compress. You can squeeze them all you like, but they won't get any smaller. So, if you apply a force, instead of reducing in size, they will flow. And he used this simple fact to solve one of the most pressing problems known to mankind. How to serve beer more quickly. Beer is kept here in the cellar where it's cool, but it's served in the bar where it's nice and warm. So, serving it involves a lot of legwork, thirsty work. Brahma set himself the task of coming up with a solution to serve the beer through a pipe to the bar. A beer engine. The beer engine works by pulling, not pushing. This handle here is connected to a cylinder. When this handle's pulled like this, it creates a vacuum which draws the beer up from the cellar into the pipe, through this nozzle and into the glass. There. Thoughtfully also, Brahma invented the water closet because all that beer has to go somewhere. Ah, how pleasant. But no doubt, sitting over his fruit-based beverage one day, Brahma wondered what would happen if the liquid wasn't released. So here's my pipe, and here's my beer engine. So I fill that, and then, if I connect another syringe to the end, I have something completely different. I have a hydraulic system. If I depress this plunger, it raises the plunger in the other syringe. It transfers the force. If I depress this smaller syringe, it travels twice the distance to raise this larger one because it's pretty much half the size. So, and here's the clever bit. If I can use this one to depress this one, because of the increased diameter of this syringe, the force applied from this end is greater. So, I can use a small force to generate a much larger force. If I make this cylinder 10 times the size of this one, this is producing 10 times more power. Just like the car brakes, a small dab on the brake pedal, small force translated, courtesy of the brakes, to a very large force. And once Brahma worked this out, he came up with something much more impressive than the beer engine. The Brahma Press. Patented in 1795. It's the same principle as the two syringes, only slightly more elaborate, a lot bigger, and uses oil instead of orange juice. You apply pressure to the oil from a tank via a hand pump, which forces it in to the cylinder of this, the large syringe. That applies the pressure, which forces the plunger out, that piston there, giving you a force at the head, the platen, of one ton. The difficulty was in making the pistons watertight. Brahma's colleague, Henry Maudsley, came up with leather collars that filled with fluid, ballooning onto the piston rod as the pressure inside the piston got greater. It was used for flattening things, like maps. It worked at the Ordnance Survey until 1966, incredibly. But, if you take the top off, that bit up there with the four nuts, instead of just pressing things, you could lift things. You could use all that force in that piston to raise things. And if you generated that force, not by hand pump, but by machine, you could lift big things. Like this. Robert Stevenson's revolutionary bridge over the Conway. It was constructed in 1847. Telford had bridged the Conway 20 years earlier, but he'd used a suspension bridge. But suspension bridge, no good for railway. 
too bouncy. Stevenson's revolutionary idea was to use a box girder so the trains actually passed through the structure. There were two of them, the up and down lines. But how do you lift them into position when they both weigh a thousand tons? Pontoons and hydraulic jacks. It was the biggest test of hydraulic lifting gear to date. The bridges were raised at an agonising two inches a minute. But it worked. Ten days after the lift, everything was bolted into position and the first trains crossed the Conway. And with a little tweak in design, hydraulic rams could be used to power cranes. Except instead of calling them rams, the lifting mechanism is called a jigger. This is a model of one of the first hydraulic cranes made by a Northumbrian industrialist, William Armstrong. It's a cylinder, a piston inside it. There's a pulley at one end connected to the piston and at the other end there's another pulley. Our hydraulic fluid, water in this case, is pumped in at pressure and that makes this chain extend and raise the load. Not surprisingly, in the 19th century, with a massive expansion in industry and trade, cranes were very much in demand. And a company called Armstrong and Company started making them at Elsick, upriver from Newcastle, on the Tyne. It wasn't long before the boss, William Armstrong, expanded the business and moved into shipbuilding and armaments. And with the fortune he amassed, he built this. Cragside, his own gothic pile in wonderful grounds. But this was no ordinary house. Despite appearances, Cragside was a house of the future, packed with the latest technology. And this is what provided the power for Armstrong's palace. Looks like a tranquil Northumbrian tarn, but it's not. That sturdy piece of Victorian engineering gives you a clue. That's a sluice gate there, and this is a dam. All that water is providing a 35-foot head of pressure, but it's not powering a water wheel. Armstrong was much more advanced than that. All this water powered an engine. He had a new power source, something that developed Brahma's use of water power to a much higher level. It's a double-acting, reciprocating hydraulic engine. There's a valve there that lets in water under pressure from the lake and it enters into one of these two valve chests which is determined at the position of this rocker arm here. Unfortunately, the all-powerful unelected health and safety executive have somehow decreed that water power is dangerous, but for the purposes of demonstration, this system is now hooked up to a small electric motor so we can see the action of the ram. The ram is now moving that way, so it's being pushed like that and this is acting as an inlet valve. This, therefore, is an exhaust. That will happen until this activating rod here kicks into action. That will now change this counterbalanced rod over and swap it around. That will now become the inlet valve and that the exhaust. And you'll see them change over. Right, now the rod is moving the other way. See the cam start to move in a minute when this chamber fills up with water. Of course, when it was working properly, it would have been a proper reciprocating action. Would have been an efficient engine. Quieter, cheaper than a steam engine. And the reason it was here was because of this. That is a cistern. It holds spring water because the lake water is undrinkable. And this simple hydraulic engine pumps this drinking water 280 feet above the house to a head attack, the Basin Lake. But Armstrong didn't just use this water for drinking, he also used it to power hydraulic machinery in his house. And it powered this. There's the water inlet valve, the water is entering this. Looks familiar doesn't it, this cylinder, pulleys both ends. It's a jigger, exactly the same as Armstrong's hydraulic cranes. Water enters here, pushing hydraulic ram that way, acting on these chains. There are chains in this case because there are three pulleys. You've got a triple action. Three pulleys gave the jigger extra lifting height. But why have a crane jigger in a stately home in the first place? 
Ground floor, kitchen, servants hall, butler's pantry. For a lift. And that's not the only thing the lake powered. Armstrong entertained a great deal at the crankside and he had to make sure his meat was properly prepared. And that needed a spit. Spits could be turned by small boys winding a handle, or by dogs in treadmills, honestly, or by clockwork, or by a vein in the chimney being turned by hot air. But this spit doesn't seem to have any visible means of propulsion. How's it going round? Ha ha! Here is the magical motive force that turns the spit. It's a Scotch turbine. What happens is that water under pressure from the lake is expelled through these nozzles like a garden sprinkler. Only instead of just wetting your fescue, this turns the central shaft that would have impressed Armstrong's guests by its secret motion. But Armstrong was going to use hydraulic power for something considerably butcher than kitchen gadgets. Something that would give his shipbuilding business quite a boost and make him even more money. Hydraulic technology was developing quickly. From humble origins dispensing cool beer, it had become a source of cheap and clean power. Now the armaments manufacturer and hydraulic power pioneer, William Armstrong, had thought of a way for it to make him more money. Armstrong's armaments empire was based at Elsick, upriver, that way. The sea is that way. And the Tyne was bridged by a stone construction, useless for allowing access upstream for anything bigger than a punt. So when the time came for the time to be improved in the 19th century, Armstrong came up with the perfect solution. A bridge that would swing out of the way to allow big ships to go upriver to have big guns fitted. The Tyne Swing Bridge. The problem was how to power it. Because ships need access all states of the tide. Tides are twice a day. If you use the steam engine, it would have to be in steam for 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Incredibly expensive. You want something that you can turn on and off, that you can use intermittently for the irregular hours that you have to swing the bridge. A hydraulic engine would be perfect. But a crag side, you've got the reservoirs developing the head of water, developing the pressure. In this city, there's no room. So Armstrong came up with a very elegant solution, the accumulator. The accumulator was Armstrong's contribution to hydraulics. It was a way of packing the water pressure of a reservoir, like the one at Cragside, into a small space. Within a tower, like this disused one at Limehouse Basin in London, an iron pressure vessel contains a column of water. On top is a massive weight putting the water under huge pressure. A steam engine forces water into the tower when levels run low, and this water could be released as and when required. So where's the accumulator for Armstrong Swing Bridge in Newcastle? Down here, a 60-foot tower of water, except of course it's a shaft, and it holds water at pressure 600 pounds per square inch. Ha-ha! The steam engine that provided the pressure for the east and west accumulators has gone now, been replaced by electric pumps. But this, the hydraulic engine that actually swings the bridge, is the original, and it's a beauty. It's a three-throw engine, three rams, which means that one is powering, one is swinging, and one is in exhaust. It's beautifully engineered. Every single one of these high-pressure pipe unions it's got a tapered thread. Lovely. That is the biggest roller bearing I've ever seen. There's a rack under there that engages with that pinion, which is connected to this gearing here. So when we want to turn the bridge, we have to put it into gear, like this. 
this worm, swinging this arm, bringing that gear into line. But to swing the bridge, I need to get out of the engine room and get into the cockpit up there. It's like a big ship. All aboard. And here's where it's all controlled. The bridge, as it were, the wheelhouse. And it feels like a ship. And like a ship, it's got a horn. Nice one. Okay. So, in order to swing this huge bridge, first of all, we have to raise it. And to raise it, you have to put the rams down. The bridge does a press up. Right. Take the bolt off. Right, the rams are now down and secured. I can then take the wedges out, raises the bridge, and then we put the rams back. Otherwise, it couldn't move. And we can now move it. There we are, that works our hydraulic engine. It opens a valve on the accumulator, sunk deep into the riverbed, releasing water under pressure into the three-stroke hydraulic engine. And slowly, the bridge starts to swing. Work started on the bridge in 1868, and it was opened in 1876. It's 281 foot long with a safety load of 60 tonnes for moving vehicles. And in the 129 years it's been running, it's opened almost 300,000 times. If this was a ship, and as it indeed resembles, and it had guns, Perhaps the 18 inch guns that Armstrong's used to make that were banned in the 20s. We could make a terrible mess of Sunderland. Not that we want to, of course. Now Armstrong's L6 shipyard could build big boats. And this one was, at the time, the heaviest and most expensive ever built on the river. The battleship Victoria, launched in April 1887. The swing bridge with its sunken accumulator was impressive, but there's no reason for the accumulator to be on site. The accumulator provides power at the turn of a valve. There's no reason why it couldn't provide power for lots of machinery. In fact, if you had a big enough accumulator and long enough pipes, you could provide power for a whole town or a city. And that's what this company did, the London Hydraulic Power Company. And that proud edifice was its accumulator tower and it powered machines across London for around 100 years. This was its engine room, now a restaurant. It's a cathedral to power. To fill that huge accumulator, the London Hydraulic Power Company installed a massive triple expansion engine in this hall. It was replaced in the 1950s by six enormous electric motors. Ah, start. They drove a flywheel, which drove three cams running these three pumps. That's the business end of that one. Filtered water from the Thames was fed from a header tank, already under pressure, in here to here, went through the pumps and came out this end, under enormous pressure. Look at that there, look at that fixing. And then it was fed up into the accumulator tower. Water 
under pressure of 700 pounds per square inch, was kept here. When water levels fell, the steam or electric engines were set to work to pump more water into the tower. It's rather ghostly now inside the accumulator tower, but at one time, there was a huge amount of energy stored in this building. And pipes carrying this high pressure water ran under the streets of London. If there was a, a burst in one of the pipes, it would send a plume of water 100 feet into the air. And here's where the pipes from the London Hydraulic Power Company head off across the Thames and that way into the city. There were 186 miles of pipes supplying 33 million gallons of pressurised Thames water a week to run 8,000 machines. So put that in your accumulator and squash it. Water powered London. Its dock gates, cranes, even Tower Bridge. It raised the organ at the Leicester Square Theatre and lifted sections of the stage at Drury Lane. And just as at Cragside, it even raised the lift at the Savoy Hotel. Even though this new form of energy, <coughs> hydraulics on tap, was clean and efficient, it was soon to be outmoded. And the very man responsible was the one who championed it in the first place. William Armstrong, never one to rest on his laurels, he was always looking for the next big thing. And the next big thing involved water as well. But water used to generate electricity. When hydroelectric power came on the scene, he was converted. Hydraulic systems weren't the perfect power source by any means. They were susceptible to cold, to drought. They needed huge volumes of water and were very costly to build. We no longer have complex city-based hydraulic systems with their own accumulators anymore, but we still utterly rely on hydraulics. For our car brakes, for power steering, for lifts, for jacks, for diggers, for dumpers, and for things like this. Gateshead Millennium Bridge, like the Tyne Swing Bridge, totally innovative. Pivots at either end and it has eight electric motors providing the power for the hydraulic rams. And it's so efficient it just costs £3.60 to move. Not bad for a couple of syringes and some tubing. <laughs> 